So I, um, I saw the film first at Cannes. It was sort of um, one of my first outings in the world of film festivals again. It felt so ecstatic to see it there on that big, fabulous screen. Yeah. Um, what was it like for, for you guys to be back on the circuit? You, I saw you at New York as well. Julie? Surreal. It was surreal. It was, we didn't, I, I didn't believe it was happening until we were there. And then, I, you know, we've never had that experience, that kind of experience as um, documentary makers, you know, it was really surreal and special and we kind of feel jaded about, we're used to everything, festivals, and that was very new and very wonderful, actually. But it is nice to actually be back. There's something about closing the loop with an audience when you're making a film. It really feels like it's landed and it's off on its life when you get to see it in front of people. So I'm really glad that we get to do it again. And and it, it th this movie, uh, Todd, I, <laughs> you've explored glam rock, you've explored Bob Dylan, <laughs> you've gone with uh, Karen Carpenter and uh, Barbie dolls, but um, you haven't been a documentary filmmaker before. <laughs> it's it's like, uh, what gave you that uh, confidence uh, to, to to jump into this? Why why did you have to do it this way? Um, well, it it it, it was uh, it came to me as a as a offer as a question uh, from David Blackman at Universal Music Group Polygram, who who I think had been talking to Laurie Anderson after she had handed off the Lou Reed archives to the New York City Public Library. And they started to talk about, would this be a time to do a, a Velvet's documentary? And if so, who might be some directors that they felt, that she felt comfortable approaching? And so he just said, would Todd be interested in doing a, a Velvet Underground documentary? I was immediately, uh, within a second, yes, absolutely. And I knew, and it's it's not necessarily that I had been burning to necessarily make a documentary. I felt like this is an art form, a form of filmmaking that I love, but that I don't, you know, necessarily presume to know how to do. What it was was about this band, the music that meant so much to me. And the, the, the band doesn't exist in traditional places that other rock documentary subjects might be in, in promotional footage and in, in concert footage and all those things where the Velvet Underground existed was in the art scene, in the filmmaking of Andy Warhol and so bound up in that avant-garde film and, mu and, and art and cultural moment. So I was like, that is so interesting. The limitations were the creative opportunities, you know? And I knew that it meant the film would look and feel completely unique and worthy of the subject in that way. So you obviously uh, pulled some people around you who did know yes. what they were doing. Yes, <laughs> so, so Julie, I mean, you know, you're one of the most experienced. You, you, you know, you've, you've been around. How did, how did you respond to this? <laughs> Oh well, when you know we when David Blackman also called us, it was I'd say half a second before we were like yes. I mean the the three of us are all big fans of Velvet Underground and all love Todd's filmmaking and his work as an artist and the idea of collaborating on this film with Todd and Christine. We were like I mean he, he told <laughs> us the concept in five minutes and we were like we can see that yeah. and I think he you delivered it. And when they, in, when we dis were discussing the project, I literally screamed because I'm such a huge Velvets fan. I'm a huge Andy Warhol fan. I'm a huge fan of Todd. So just like the, all of that coming together, I it was screamed. Like somebody just came in and said, <laughs> "Here's your dream." It was, was like, really. Oh, nice. you were a great was, asset was for research who talked for to you that. guys. For, for like, yeah. even though, for in my in my view of it, it was Christine who said we need partners. Vashon, your partner, my, my but then it's missing tonight. And but then, then she, Dave, communicated she communicated to David, to David and we had done the Apollo with David, so he right, knew us. Right, because uh -huh. Christine was like, these are the people we have to work with, and Christine had researched them and just took a second and was like, these are our people. And it was just so immediately apparent that that was true. So well, tell we had me lunch how. And we knew. So yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. But I'm curious about what were the, in, uh, in my mind, your ability to reinvent the documentary, to come at it with fresh eyes, to not know what the rules were, was an asset. Do you do you agree? 
Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's I mean, a new it's, language. Yeah. It, it, that was the idea. The idea, can we tell it through these images? Can we tell it through this so we could experience it rather than understand it just intellectually? It became visceral. And you were the archive maven, as I understand it. <laughs> yes. That must have been part of what you were excited by. Oh, absolutely. It, um, at her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she gave you your presence. Yeah, yes. So, I mean, to tell the story, you need the cooperation of the Warhol Museum because all of their incredible, you know, it's really the majority of what has been filmed of the Velvet Underground is what was filmed at the factory. So that was a first um, relationship that we quickly started to set up. And it was just like the most fun trip. We all, with Christine and, and us and Brian O'Keefe, our archival producer, got to go to Pittsburgh at the museum. Which and was closed. We got which to was, wander around yeah. the closed museum. And they were bringing out all of these artifacts, you know, with white gloves to show us everything. And I'm just nerding out because I'm just loving everything that they're showing us. Is there um, an original album cover with the with the yes, banana? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, like the stuff they were showing us was insane. And um, and Greg Pierce, who's the curator, the, the archivist at the museum. He was just a huge resource because it wasn't. He has this encyclopedic knowledge of what Warhol did, but he also knows all the other artists that that were in that scene. So he would tell us, "You need to think about this artist." There's, you know, there's a film called Super Artist that we licensed that was by um, uh, the two, the pair. Juan, yeah, and Bruce. Bruce uh, 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 Talbert, yes, and he's and he was. I, he said, I think Mama had just restored had had the restored they had, version. They had, a, they had the, original the original version, original version that, that was shown yeah. in 1968 that yeah. no one had really yeah. seen. That's so the part he, where the kids' voice is saying, "There's a band called the Velvet Underground <laughs> with, the, with all these crazy, all crazy clips. images." So, um, so sorry, I'm just like spinning out, but like, but it was just so much fun to to really kind of dig in and and explore not just the band itself, which is just so great. And they're all just so wonderful storytellers in and of themselves. You know, like Moe's delivery sure. uh, is hysterical. Lou's sense of humor is outrageous. Just like listening to his interviews was so much fun. But um, but then to delve into the, the avant-garde and experimental cinema as well was, was extraordinary and like Brian O'Keefe did an amazing job kind of curating the films that we should really look at um, and so very, that was very very long list a very long list but Todd you and knew a lot of this stuff already I mean you're I'm the like, old brown I, semiotician you I, know I did but it really it was Brian is my partner he's an insane researcher and he and he just did the deep dive into it and it's a broad dive it's a deep and broad dive and uh but it was like and but as carolyn says the the sort of prerequisite for making the film there was no way we'd have been able to make the film without an agreement with the andy warhol with the Warhol films and their archive and it also established the terms and the and the issues of how we would pay for it because we wanted to establish the the sort of initial agreement with what they would allow us to do per, per minute and use that when we approach other archives. So it was a building block, but if they had said no, there'd be no, that would be it. And so, and they knew that, that we needed them and that gave them some leverage, but they also knew that they needed this. They needed this film. You know, this is not the Andy Warhol Foundation that deals with the paintings. This is the Andy Warhol Museum that deals with the films. And they're very different entities, obviously. So how hard was it to get John Cale on board? He is the most extraordinary revelation for me in this. Again, there would be no way to make it without John's agreement and blessing and an agreement to participate and give of himself. How much you ever are going to get, I'm learning as, the, as a fresh documentarian, <laughs> is something you don't know. And the process in which you try to 
make them comfortable and come prepared and make them feel like you, you've really done your work on your end, but that you let them go where they're going to go. And John's, you know, an extraordinary artist who there are times in anyone, any artist's life's life where they feel like talking about the past and there are times where they maybe don't feel like talking about the past. So you want to gauge it appropriately. So we had to sort of, a lot of it was a dance of coaxing and courting. And dealing with gatekeepers. And gatekeepers. This is sort of a dysfunction. No, John excluded. There's sort of a dysfunctional family around the factory folks. But also a lot of them were off the grid, too. Yeah. Like Jonathan Richmond, it was like, you know, six uh, email address. He doesn't have an they email address. Have... He doesn't have a cell phone. He doesn't have a computer. You it's know, an so, answering machine. So doesn't fly. he doesn't fly. So how did you find him? We uh, Don Fleming, who is at the, he Laurie, he works with Laurie Anderson in the Lou Reed Estate, knew a DJ who interviewed him one time, who knew a friend who knew the manager. So we, I called all those people and then finally got to Jonathan, and he was like, "Of course I'll do this for you." Oh, that you know? was money. That was money. <laughs> yeah. He was, was great. Mo, I mean, Mo, it was the, it was the same Mo Tucker. Kind of Kind of you had your friends from Yola Tango I did. Yeah. reach I out to Mo. I didn't fail. I wrote a letter to He wrote George, a beautiful uh, letter. <laughs> never got to her, you know. Yeah. And it, it was Sal McCurry, who he's a personal collect. He's, he has his own personal archive. He works a lot with Doug Yule. He be, he's a super fan who became friends with all the band members. And he tried a couple times, and he just couldn't get through to her. And then one day I was talking to him, and he said, you know what, I'm... Uh, I'll call you back. And he hung up, and he, I didn't know this, he called her and got her. She p actually picked up the phone, and he, he said, I'm having a producer call you. And he hung up, and he said, if you call right now, she will pick up. And, uh, and I, you know, it's, it's like Maureen Tucker, so, and the, you know, I was all nervous. And <laughs> but she was like, of course, yeah, if you, you just have to come to Georgia, and, and I'll do an interview with you guys, you know. Wow. Remote Georgia. And then you yeah. had Ed Lockman <laughs> doing 16 millimeter. Explain yeah. that. Um, he did, it, was, it, was, uh, it was digital. He shot it on digital, but he did Super 8. We did ah. Super 8 pieces on everybody, which we used a lot in the film. We grained up our digital. We wanted everything to sort of get in, in the same world. We did. And, and a lot of it is also the way, really, it's about how all of the interview sections are framed. They're formatted in a one three three aspect ratio. The really the the sort of geometric formal language is about how does the one three three aspect ratio, which is as many of you guys know, is the sixteen millimeter square. How does that that is really our vernacular? So if you do two squares and they touch the left and the right margins of the frame in a diptych, as Warhol would do with Chelsea Girls, that became one format. But if you turn it into four squares, like we do for the um, uh, Pale Blue Eyes, um, uh, what's his name? Brackage, thank you. Stan Brackage <laughs> section, it's a four square grid. And then we explode into 12 frames for the 60s section and, any, and everything in between. Sometimes you zoom completely into, push right into the 60 millimeter frame, lose some of the left and right when it, I mean top and bottom when it's, Full frame aspect ratio, 185. This sounds technical and boring, but for me it was a palette yeah. to dive into. As that I could the bring my, and the backdrops, and which I, I could loved, bring my editors into. All right, talk about the backdrops, but I also loved the sections where you had the Warhol uh, shots of these guys staring the at the camera. Tests. Yeah. yeah. That, that had the weirdest impact. Did you, did you understand how it was going to play? Tell, tell me what, what, <laughs> what you were going for there. Well, look, these are, these are very famous images. And we've most, uh, most of us have seen stills from the screen tests and maybe clips in documentaries about Warhol. I've never watched an entire screen test from beginning to end, a two and a half minute reel from sprockets to sprockets, emulsion coming in and emulsion going out. And it wasn't until we started to construct this first act of the film, and you literally watch Lou Reed breathing and existing in time next to a composite shot, and a parallel shot 
that's describing his childhood. And you feel like he's both witnessing the act of storytelling itself, which sort of pulls you out, and then you actually feel like you're living with him in time and which pulls you in at the same time. So it had, we had these in our ideas in our head, but it's not until you really watch them unfold that I think the power of the surprise of that recognition uh, comes through, even for us while making it. So when you were working with your editors, um, this was during the pandemic? The pand oh, um, Adam yeah, had, you guys described, because it was a Go scheduling ahead. and budgeting thing that Christine and I would never have been able to figure out. It's and called overages. <laughs> it's called documentary, <laughs> you know. It's well, I mean, really what happened is we shot all of the interviews. In 2018. Yeah, and then Todd went to make Dark Waters, his fiction feature film, um, with Fonz. And Adam, so the editors are Fonzo and Adam, and Adam was in our office in Brooklyn editing and in communication with Todd and Fonz during that period. And then after the film, your film released, you came back and you and Fonz were in LA and then COVID hit. And then they were a pod, a bubble here. And Adam, we kind of like rushed him home with his system in Brooklyn and he started editing from there. So that was the communication. But I guess I'm asking this because given how complex and, and visually sophisticated this was, it must've been even harder to gauge somehow how it was working in this uh, digital universe. Maybe not. It was full immersion by necessity and even deeper immersion after COVID. And so Fonzie and I were already in the same room, <clears throat> so we quarantined together. Okay. So we were just living with each other. In And I would go every day. Uh, I, I could walk to work in Venice where I was staying, go into this world mm -hmm. in that very uncertain, crazy time. And I was uh, I was cutting on an avid. Ad, Fonzie was cutting on an avid. Adam was in New York cutting on an avid, and we would just be swapping everything we're doing all day long, and we didn't want it to end. It was such a um, it was such an incredibly nourishing creative experience for us. I can see that. And and Todd did a lot of editing himself. You know, Adam and Fonz are brilliant editors, but it was really three of them with Avid's, you know, cutting all these scenes. Well, you had time yeah. to noodle yeah. around yeah. and experiment. I think it shows, actually. Um, um, it almost, I made, all right, so someone said you actually had two and a half hours of footage in a two hour movie, which is yeah. a way to go. With it was interviews. fun clearing it all. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that question. How bad was it? So they were almost done. <laughs> <laughs> there are orphan things in the world, and you could do your due diligence and you try to find who it belongs to, but at some point it becomes something that you just use. And I, I think at the 11th hour, somebody popped up on not long ago. And we had a discussion and we compensated them and it was fine, but you never know when it's going to happen. When you, you, I think we're clear now, right? I think we're almost In our clearance lawyer we call Chicken Little because it's like as soon as we called him, he was like, this is gonna cost a million dollars. You know, like he's always like, it's gonna be a disaster. And it was totally a lovely person, it was fine. They came to the screening last night, you know, it was all good. But it's always that kind of feeling of, you know, like somebody in imposing that panic. And it really was, UMG, it was David Blackman and UMG who ultimately covered the overages yeah. at a point where we really didn't know how we were going to make the difference. Well, you know what? They saw this film and they believed in it and they loved it. Like, that was the thing. I mean, Adam always said when he was nervous when David first came to look at the first cut or the first assembly. And David was like, he didn't this, flinch. Is, this is yeah. great. Oh, David was with us. David yeah. saw it too. Da that's why... David was excited because of you, because of your vision, and, and I think that it, you know, it paid off. He could see it evolving forward, that it was getting there. And Apple like, TV wow. Plus came in also. Yes. yes. So that was sold to them in um, Cannes two years ago. And um, you're a man who likes to see your movie on the big screen. Yes. It's going to be day and date. It Tomorrow is. T it Tomorrow. opens. Tomorrow. But they supported and stood by, even amid COVID, the, the conditions that we wanted this to be a theatrical release. 
and it's opening in 100 theaters around the country and about 140. 140. 140. 140. I oh, think wow. yeah. that's incredible. Magnolia Pictures, the Magnolia wonderful Pictures distributor, had partnered with board. us, and so as you guys know, as filmmakers. You know, and it's different for different films, but we all want to see our films on the screen. It wasn't when I saw it at Cannes, it was of course seeing it on that gorgeous screen at the Lumiere Theater, but it was the sound. Yeah. It was the impact of the sound, and that's something no home theater is going to be able to replicate. So if you liked what you saw and you it's it, you know, we were, we're urging people to try Spread to go the to the theater yeah. and yeah. see it while it's still on the screen. So I understand John Cale saw it last night yes. for the first time. First time, First on, time the on the screen. On the big screen. All right. How, what did he say? He loved it. Okay. He has, um, well, he comes off well. <laughs> his uh, partner in crime sent in like a love letter. It was just great. It was really special, and he was just so generous He's and on wonderful. Stage with me yeah. afterwards. I'm still a fan at heart, so I'm just like, I'm sitting there next to John Cale, and John Cale's in my movie, and he gave so much of himself, and he's such a eloquent. You know, he also looks so incredibly gorgeous. Yeah. He's, he, does. he doesn't, he, look, he looks insanely Total crush. beautiful. It's just, yeah. thank you, Ed Lockman, and your lighting. <laughs> but also, those Welsh bones and jeans and whatever he inherited, he, it's doing him well. Well, the, the, the thing I wanted to, you to answer a little bit is, is, is it, it isn't so much just the music as it is the cultural petri dish that, that, that the music was in. And, and I wondered if you could explain how you see the Velvet Underground having impacted the future. Well, I think what they were doing, and I, I think you see it maybe, maybe they themselves didn't see this as clearly until they went to the West Coast and it was a clash of countercultures. And they really saw that what was happening in the New York world was so informed by this sort of ulterior, queer, sort of investment in a kind of marginality that revealed things about the counterculture at large that were a little bit bourgeois by comparison, to say, is, is one way of putting it, a little uptight, a little sexist, a little homophobe, you know. That's why the feminist movement needed to happen at the end of the 60s. That's why a gay liberation movement needed to happen in the 1970s. But what was so unique about what was happening in New York is that it wasn't political, it wasn't intellectual, it was aesthetic. But it provided a way of seeing the world that I think <clears throat> hadn't been explored even amid so much incredible stuff that was happening in the 60s. And it opened the door for glam rock and punk rock and grunge and so many other kinds of expressions of, you know, not always affirmative uh, experiences. And independent cinema. And, and independent. And you. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, and the, the new queer cinema. I, you know, there's something about that sense of a standing in opposition to the status quo and maintaining a critical perspective on, on dominant culture, for lack of a better word. That was certainly something that I felt like I was you know, inspired by the Velvets. We could go on, but um, I'm going to wrap this up. And I'm going to wrap it up on a sad note. Um, today, one of the great uh, documentary uh, producer, filmmakers, executives, Diane Weirman from Participant, uh, passed away. And I know, Julie, you were close to her. Um, we uh, all of you yeah. were, uh, knew her, and I knew her, and I'm very sad. Uh, and I just want to celebrate her a bit and, and, and remember her. <laughs> Watch a Diane movie this week. Well, I mean, her impact on the documentary field is like unprecedented. It, she's uh, completely shaped kind of where we are today. So it was a From inconvenient truth yeah. uh, to uh, any number of things. And as Al Gore said to yeah. her sister, that she changed the world with yeah. her movies. And I think that that allowed her sister to see her for the first time in full, mm. to really appreciate what she'd lost. Yeah, it's a huge she, loss for yeah. It was her whole life. She, she gave herself to the films and, and never stopped. All right. Thank you all. Welcome back. Thanks, you guys. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you.